All right, y'all, y'all better go for it. It get bad. <laughs> oh, God bless you. Whew. Y'all, <laughs> welcome to Motivate Church. <laughs> I can't promise it's not always like this. It is. This is a house where we believe that if we're going to call him the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the one true living God, we would be remiss to not let a living God control the flow of this service. Before we get moving, I, I, I stepped in the text a little bit, but I want to bring this thing home. We won't be here long because I want you to have some time to chat about this with your family. I want you to turn to Luke chapter 8, verse 1. We won't be here long. Luke chapter 8, verse 1. And it says this, after this, Jesus traveled from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God, and the 12 were with him. Somebody say 12. Isn't it interesting? That even a savior who had the ability to heal broken bodies, mend broken minds, resurrect dead people, cause lepers to be healed, even he had a crew. Some of us in this room, the reason why our faith walk and journey with the Lord has not been that strong is because we think we can do bad all by ourselves. If Jesus, Jesus, could make the choice to appoint individuals in his life based upon where they are, knowing the potential that they had, and cause them to be able to walk with him, what makes you think that you can do life alone? You've been trying for years, and the problem is you've been looking for perfect friends, not promised friends. Promise, friends, of this. I see a promise over your life that may benefit you, which may try to distract me. There's certain friends in your life that are only meant for a season, and you have to be okay with that. Jesus appointed individuals in his life who could walk with him. Though he knew where he had to go, which was the cross, he appointed individuals who had the timing to not force him to that place sooner. And for some of us, we've appointed friends in our lives who are trying to rush us to Calvary. It's quiet. There's some friends in your life that you self-appointed because they make you feel comfortable and not convicted. There are some people in your life that you need to dedicate time to who may only be there to set you up to get to your destiny. It's interesting it never shows in the scripture that Judas was misfed or that he was mistreated leading up to his decision. You got to feed Judas the same way you do Peter. And the problem is, you've decided that you are the judge, the jury, and the executioner. And now in your life as a believer, you've been walking, trying to find someone to assist you to get to your breakthrough. But the problem is, no one likes you. Oh, we've turned. Because you believe that it's your job to be everybody's decision maker. Jesus allowed each one of these disciples to figure out their own faith and salvation. All he did was kept pointing them to the source. And isn't it interesting that even though he could have just pointed them to himself, he gave them opportunities to figure it out. We see here in this text that you have to make a decision. Who will be your circle? If you leave here today and you get nothing, I challenge you to assess your crew. Assess your circle. Assess your people. If the only reason you came here today is because someone invited you, but you got 12 other friends who were cool with you being in your mess, assess your circle. Assess your circle. For you to know that there's something that could give me life and you still want to chill with me in death, assess your circle. It's real weird, real, real weird. We see here that Jesus made the decision to go from town to town. I love that about Jesus because he chose to get up even though he was effective. I know we took in a turn, but some of us in our lives, it's time to move. 
you've gotten victory in one place and you don't want to move because you don't know what it's going to be like over there. You've gotten breakthrough at your home church and your home church like, bye. (laughs) It's time to move. We see here in this next text that it goes on to say, and also some women who have been cured of evil spirits and diseases, evil spirits and diseases. I love that because there's an S on the end of both. It's apostrophe. That means that there was multiple of each. This one woman, Mary, had seven demons come out. Mary Magdalene had seven demons come out. Her interaction with Christ in following him provided breakthrough from what was torturing her. The problem why some of us haven't got our breakthrough is because we've yet to commit to him. We know he can. We just don't want him to. And that's cool. Now, if you want to court your demons, say that, but don't cry out, I want to be free, but you still want to set up dates. I already got him out the grave, so we're good. I already told him he got up, right? We're good. Seven demons. She had a demon for every day. Monday demon, Tuesday demon. If Wednesday got sick, Thursday could have showed up. I love this. I love this for two reasons. The American church has done everything it could to demonize and cause women to believe that they are less less than inside of the church. I just stomped on somebody's theological toes. We've done everything we can to hush the women to know that they have the ability and the power within to be a room shaker. I know y'all didn't think this was about to be no empowerment conversation, but baby, we here. We see here that in the conversation of him leading with the 12, it comes on the back end of the text. And it says some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases, which goes to tell me that Jesus is able to use you with the mess that you have in you. You've been waiting for your therapist to give you the green light to go get Jesus. Can I tell you, they don't have a prescription for that. They don't, they don't have a prescription. Your insurance will not cover this transformation. But can I tell you, baby, there is no deductible. There is no copay. It's already been paid for. Some women who have been cured of evil spirits and diseases. And some of us in this room, there's some things on us right now. You may not have seven, but you got three. I'm not that bad. My mama had eight. Here you go trying to assess demons, not knowing that all you have to do is evict. Why are you trying to make pet names for what's trying to kill you? Once again, he's already out the grave, so don't y'all put no pressure on me. It says here that in verse Two, it goes on to say, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna and many others, these women were helping to support them out of their own means. Why is it that the church never talks about these women? Mike, escort me back to the car because I think they're going to jump me. Why is it to this day, I know this is not the Easter message you expected, but why is it to this day that the church is upheld by the foundation pillars of women doing the work and giving the money and the men saying, did you have a good time? We never want to talk about it. But the pastor is a man, but a woman's doing all the work. We, We never want to talk about it. When the pastor gets the glory, but there's a lady in the background who's doing all the praying. We, we never want to talk about it. We never want to talk about this text where we see these women who came out of their own pocket, their own means. Yes, Peter could lift, but I could pay. This woman, Mary, this woman, Joanna, this manager, Susanna, they made the decision. 
that I got to get beyond my evil spirits and my demons and my diseases to get to where I need to be. The question is, how hungry are you for your breakthrough? How hungry are you for your break? It's bigger than you getting the victory. I'm so sorry to step on your American theology. You see yourself as the victor and you are the one who's going to get the glory out of it all. And, ooh, I can't wait. They're going to put me in the hall of faith, baby. I'm going to be the one after I die. They're going to put a name on the chair for me because I was the best vacuumer at the church. Get past your flesh. Get past your flesh. How many people got saved this week even though you didn't open your mouth? I'll drink. How many people got closer to Jesus this week based upon your actions and your activities and the way that you act, the way that you drive? Mary had to make a decision. She could have been settled with her freedom, but she chose to go deeper. Some of us in this room, We've never made it to the tomb because we were just happy with getting free. Where are you? Where, where are you? Where are you at? Where are you at? The time has come for you to assess the grave. Where are you? For some people, the death of Christ was a hall pass for them to go back to their sin. And the same thing goes for some of us in this room. The death of your church experience or the death of what you saw as perfection in the body of Christ. The death of your perception of a leader who was perfect. Everyone in here who may have had church hurt, that was the stop of your faith. But can I tell you, you've been called to higher than a location. You've been called to a kingdom. And here you are. You were active in the kingdom when you had a platform. But the moment that you lost your title, you had no push. The moment that you lost your position, you had no power. The moment that you lost your place, you had no prayer. Where have you been? What do you do when I'm free, but I can't save them? What, can you imagine Mary in this season of her life? She's seen Jesus do so much. She saw Jesus heal broken bodies. Mary, who saw Jesus deliver her from demons, deliver her from diseases, she saw Jesus be on one side of the river <laughs> and appear on the other side. This Mary, who saw a Savior heal a leper that no one wanted to touch. This Mary, who saw him heal blind eyes to be restored to see. This Mary, who saw a Jesus healed broken limbs to come back to life. This Jesus who healed the lame people to walk. This Jesus who took the time when the ceiling came crashing in on him and he dusted off his shoulder and said, you are made whole. This Jesus, this Jesus who said, oh, you can't hear me. Now can you? This Jesus who caused all manners of evil that was meant to destroy him work for his good. This Jesus. What does she do? What do you do when the Jesus that you've seen never break a sweat, now sweat blood? What do you do when this perfect Christ allows himself to be beaten? What do you do? The problem is you have a fetish with superhero Jesus. You don't like broken Jesus. You love perfect Jesus. You love Jesus. Some people see Jesus with like this Iron Man outfit. Like he's Captain America. And the problem is you can't wrap your mind around the fact that this Jesus who died for you didn't die a life that was perfect in the sense of this beating that was just cute. It was just a little. No, he took lashes. They said his entrails hung out of his body. They said that you could see through the skin. I know this is vulgar, but this is the real. They said that at this point, it was as if every single bone in his body had been broken. They beat him bad. Where does your faith go when you see your Savior bleed? Where's your faith? That's why some of us lost our faith the moment that the doctor said what was gone returned. 
That's why some of us, our faith left the moment that that child that we poured years into all of a sudden act like they don't have no common sense. Where is your faith? When that marriage that you poured everything into, you helped him get his credit score right, helped him start his business, and he still don't know how to act like he got some sense. Are we talking? Where's your faith? When you ask God if you could just take one more hit, but this time it was a bad one. Where's your faith? How is your faith when the body that you gave over to him all these years to serve him now feels broken? Where's your faith? Mary had to make a decision. Do I continue to follow a savior that I've now seen broken? What about you? In this room, what is your decision? Will you still follow a savior that you've seen broken? Because your salvation had to come through a breaking. It came through a beating. It came through some turmoil. It came through some mess, and you're telling me you're not willing to go through 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years of some trials? You're not willing to go through your car being repossessed because you didn't budget, and you blamed it on God? You're willing to tell me that you're blaming God for taking your family member who's been eating hog moths and chitlins for 40 years, but it's God's fault that they didn't make it. Oh, we're real. We put all the blame on a broken savior because it's easier to hand it over to someone who won't chastise me. But can I tell you that you got to make the decision, do I want to follow a perfect savior or do I want to follow a pretty one? Some of us in this room, we have to reframe our minds on who Jesus is. The power was not in the fact just that he got up. The power started in the fact that he allowed them to beat him. We skip that part. We skip it. He could have caused all the angels in heaven to come down and fight for him. But he took it. He could have caused his disciples and let them fight. Peter was ready to cut. My man. But he let them beat him. Can I ask you the question? When's the last time you beat Jesus? When's the last time that your decisions reminded him like a PTSD experience of when he was beaten over 2,000 years ago? When did your response to correction that separated you from the love of God based upon what you thought could can I let you know there's nothing you could do that can separate you? <laughs> you tried every drug and you thought it would separate you. Even with the booger sugar, he still loved you. <laughs> I had to break the tension, y'all. I had to break it. Even shooting stuff up your arms, he still loves you. You can smoke every strain, indica, sativa, hybrid, you name it. He still loves you. You can sleep with every person's spouse. You may itch, but he still loves you. I knew, I knew you had me. I knew you had me. Can I? The reason why I say all of this is because we close this out, we believe just because he'll allow you means that he approves. We serve a God of free will. And you've been believing that God has been trying to force you to live right. You have to decide to live right. What an amazing word. Thank you so much for being here with us at Motivate Church. If this word impacted you in any way, hit the like button and let us know in the comments. But take it a step further. Share it with a friend, share it with a family member that you know their life could be changed by this word. Subscribe to our YouTube channel as well and hit the notification bell so that you don't miss anything that's happening within the life of the ministry. And if you would like to partner with us financially, click the link in the description box. We love you and we'll see you next week.